How many of you heard of NFSI? Oh, that's it? Okay, well, you're, you're all going to walk out of here hearing a lot about NFSI. Um, I founded the NFSI back in 1997 as a 501c3 charitable foundation. It's a foundation. It's my foundation. So everything that is done through NFSI historically has been done through me. In other words, I don't get paid. It costs me money to run the foundation, which I do happily. We have a 15-member board of directors that govern uh, the NFSI, Pat's just joined the board. But you know, folks like former head of OSHA is on the board. We have lawyers, doctors, a lot of industry professionals, a lot of research people. It's a very diverse crowd. Uh, but you know, NFSI um, is unique. We're, we're here to help you solve and prevent your slip, trip, and fall problems. We're not commercial. We don't sell anything. We, we write the standards, which we'll talk about here in a minute. I publish a lot of books. That's one of the best sellers called Falls Aren't Funny. That came out a number of years ago, and it kind of defines this, the state of um, where we are as a, as a country. Falls are the leading cause of injury for everybody. I mean, it's, I don't care what industry you are. Just, and obviously you know that because, um, well, you're here. And so in your world, you have heard of the safety pyramid. We call it the slip and fall. Am I in your way, Pat? Slip and fall safety period, uh, pyramid for every person that dies 23 people are going to fall and you're going to report an injury claim. But you have 70 people that are falling and you don't even know about it. Those are the ones you need to worry about. Not everybody dies as a result of a fall. Uh, in this, uh, this time last year, it was about 36,000 Americans will die as a result of a fall. Fall meaning fall from an elevation, fall on the same level. There's a lot of different falls. You track the, you track the claims and you do an okay job. I'm not being critical, but it's, you don't always record them. But the real threat is that 70. That 70 is getting bigger and bigger because our population is getting older and older, and that's who falls, right? Those are the people falling, for the most part. And we're taking this outside of the workplace. We're just talking now about guests, customers. So you have to manage your slip and fall problem two ways. One, in-house footwear is a, a role, plays a role, and all the other aspects because when you have customers coming into your stores, your restaurants, you're not controlling their shoes, right? You can't say what shoe to wear. So you give that up. That control that you had for workers kind of goes away. Uh, this is the clearly the most widely, most popular piece of information that everybody downloads from our website. It's the causation of slips and falls. We omitted trips and falls. This is just slips. 50% of your problem is your floor. Maintaining your floors, putting in the right floors, floors that have damage, whatever it might be. We're going to cover that in a minute. About 24% of your problem, and this is workplace now, is footwear. So I asked a question earlier, Pat, or yesterday, how many of you wear or have your staff in slip-resistant footwear? And you all raised your hands. Obviously, that's what we're here to talk about. Eh, but you still got a slip and fall problem, meaning the shoes are helping, but they're not getting you to where you want to be. Is that fair? You need more help. You need to understand the other components. So if you were to make your floors perfectly safe and get everybody, including your customers, in, in the safety shoes, even then you would only so solve about 75% of your problem. And I'm not here to discourage you. I'm just here to inform you as to the real issues. The remaining pieces of the pie deal with things like hazard identification. Um, sadly, most people use wet floor signs the wrong way all the time. They just put them out all the time. Floor signs, the floor signs a permanent fixture. Floor is not wet. We did a study a number of years ago that found 65% of the time you see a wet floor sign, the floor is not wet, nor has it been wet. It's just seen as, well, liability, you know, if we have the sign out, nobody will sue us. Well, you're going to get sued. But, you know, not using proper barricades, not using signs the correct way, not even using the right type of sign. And there are some standards for that. Uh, fraud. About 10% of your slip and fall claims are fraud. And I don't mean hard fraud like lady comes in, puts water on the floor, and lays down. I mean soft fraud. People who are getting hurt, but they kind of milk it. You know what I mean? They kind of make it out to be a lot bigger than it is. That's hard to detect. That's a real hard way to manage those people. The last part, which is actually the hardest of them all, is training. You're dealing with a younger workforce. You're dealing with uh, Gen Zs. That's a whole different world. How they learn, how they retain information. 
Um, they're very conscious about safety. It's, uh, they're, they're really big on social um, issues, but they're hard to train. They're different. You have to train them a bit differently than other generations. Uh, here's a snapshot. The average victim of a slip and fall, again, this is not just workplace, is a woman over the age of 60. 60 year olds and older are the ones falling, they're the ones that are getting hurt, they're the ones that are dying. It's all driven by the elderly. Now you say, well, we don't employ a lot of elderly people. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But I'll guarantee you, if you're a grocery store, that's all that's coming in. A lot are older people. They fall a lot and they get hurt. And there's an entire marketplace of attorneys that advertise everywhere. We were talking about that today. Billboards, television, yellow pages, everywhere you go. There is an attorney wanting your case, so you, and who are they, they're, su they're suing you, right? I mean, that's, you're the target. Average trip and fall, slip trip and fall claim is about $12,800. That's just no lawsuit, just somebody gets hurt. That's the average cost of you processing a claim. You multiply that times tens of thousands of claims and that number gets really big, really fast. And it doesn't even include litigation. The cost of a lawsuit's gonna run you easily $100,000 and that's going up. That's just legal fees. That's just the lawyers. And we have this issue called nuclear verdicts, which is rampant. All the insurance companies are talking about it. In fact, they talked about it at our symposium. It's not unusual where, you know, a couple years ago, it'd be a $300,000 jury verdict, 200,000. Now it's 20 million, 30 million. That devast, I mean, it can literally wipe you out. Or certainly change the way you purchase insurance. And since 1980, for those of you who were old enough to remember 1980, uh, slip and fall lawsuits, have risen by well over 300%. Does anybody remember what happened in 1980, Pat? Were you, you were just born then, right? That's the year that doctors and lawyers were allowed to advertise. For those of you who are not old enough, there was a time where doctors were considered unprofessional and they were not permitted to advertise. How many of you remember that? The laws changed and, and lawyers began to advertise. And we now see the big pharmaceutical industries advertising. They're big advertisers. So they promote this awareness. That graph on the right just is, if you were to look at it today, just, it's just taken off. So we got, a, we got an elder fall provo uh, problem. Uh, one of the things that those of you who may know of NFSI, we are the national standards developer. We're a uh, standards developing organization. We were part of ANSI's family for about 14 years. We kind of outgrew them because we became kind of international. And so the NFSI publishes all the international standards specifically on walkway safety. You will not find standards in, that are very deep, at least in ASTM or a, uh, ANSI or anybody else. So we write those, that's what we do. And we write the standards for you. We write the standards to prevent people from getting hurt. But if you don't, if you don't adopt them, the bad things are gonna happen because you just keep doing what you've been doing and nothing's necessarily gonna change. Uh, that's a quick list of uh, some of the standards that we've been working on, if you notice the ones in yellow, those are all published. Those exist. Those establish the standard of care. Do you understand me? When sued, those establish the standard of care. So you get called into a deposition and the lawyers will go through these and say, do you test your floors? Well, actually they ask a simpler question. Uh, what's your number one claim, injury claim in your, in your business? And you will say, slips and falls. Then they'll ask you, do you test your floors? And you'll say, no. And they'll say, well, it's your biggest claim and you don't even know what, you don't even, you don't even measure it? I mean, you don't even know what's going on? I mean, then it gets worse after that. But look at these standards, wet barefoot standard, uh, product labeling standard, entranceway floor mats. That's, the, that's probably the, the biggest one. All the floor mat manufacturers, all the big guys, all do this. They were on the committee, they authored it, they, they, they're tested their products, then they're doing a great job. Notice the B101.7 standard, that's the wet, oily footwear outsole standard. Uh, your speaker yesterday, who I refer to as good cop, today I'm the bad cop, uh, Jeffrey, uh, when he talked about the research behind testing, that's, that's, that's the standard. Um, that is published today that actually measures the slip resistance of Shoes, outsoles, and you'll see the device today or tonight when you come to our offices. But you go on down the whole list, folks, and you kind of get the idea. You know, we wrote the rules of the road for you. And if you want to drive on the left side of the road like they do in the UK, you're probably going to get in an accident, or you don't drive on the road at all. 
follow the rules, and the rules are good. They're not designed to protect everybody. And so that's what most people know NFSI for. Uh, this program is entitled the five steps, or five easy steps in preventing slips, trips, and falls. The first step, which is the easiest, is simply test your floors. You need to know if your floors present a risk of a slip hazard. Don't assume, don't you know, think because this, the manufacturers of the floors that you purchase rated them as being safe that they are, because floors change. Floors change with time, wear, and cleaning. And so the first thing you wanna do is start testing your floors. Because if you don't measure, how do you know what's going on? I mean, how do you, I mean, one of the questions that attorneys love to ask is they'll say, so, um, are your floors safe? How do you answer that? Now you're involved in a lawsuit, right? And you'll say, well, yeah, they're safe. They'll say, well, how do you know? I mean, we're here for a lawsuit. Obviously, they're not that safe. But if you say, well, we test them, we measure them, we track them, we maintain them in a way that we know that they are in compliance with the standards, um, that will help. CNA Insurance, which was on our board of directors a number of years ago, uh, did a study. And they wanted to measure the risk of slips and falls using what's known as tribometry. Tribometry is a fancy term for measuring the slip resistance of a floor. And what CNA basically set out to do is to measure the static coefficient of friction of, a floor, of their floors for one of their largest um, clients, which is a national restaurant chain. So they went into the restaurant chain, 362 franchise restaurants, and over a three year period, uh, they tested 112 stores, floors, they, de they developed hundreds of thousands of data points. They went into the restaurants that they were insuring to see just how slippery are these floors, okay? They tested to the NFSI B101.1 standard, and they used a device called the BOT3000, which today is called the track scan. You'll see that tonight. It's a portable device. Here's what they found. Most of the floors in the fast food industry, quick serve industry, were moderate traction. Okay, um, so the, most of the claims that they were paying were floors that were not really, really bad and not really, really good. They were kind of in the middle. About 29% of all their claims were low traction. We're gonna talk about these terms in a minute. But here's the magic little key. Only 13% of claims were uh, in stores that had high traction floors. Meaning if you're able to keep your floors in that NFSI high traction range, you can prevent up to 87% of your claims. And that's a national fast food restaurant chain. I mean, that's not one store, that's hundreds of restaurants. And this was done by their insurance company. So only 13% of the claims that they were paying were on floors that were in that high traction range. So the goal is to measure your floors and to keep them in that high traction range. It's not particularly difficult. Uh, you're measuring either static or dynamic coefficient of friction. Uh, it's fairly simple today. All the technology is such that it's been made to be very, very simple. You can do this yourself. You don't need to have an engineering degree. It takes literally seconds. And it's a great auditing tool. It's a great way to go out and just take measurements to know what's going on in your, in your facilities. Uh, the three traction range, high traction, and then you have moderate and then low traction, they, they actually have designated coefficient of friction value. So, it can become very technical where you're measuring COF. If you notice, all the values are a decimal point, like 0 0.44, 0 0.30. Um, it's important for people that are really wanting to have the data, but at the end of the day, just keep your floors in that high traction range, good things happen. If, you, if they go into the moderate or low traction range, the risk goes up. What we've done when we wrote these standards is we, we didn't really want to follow the same pattern that was around for 100 years in the United States, which is pass fail good, bad, safe, unsafe. There's no such thing, it's just risk. You see, people can slip on high traction floors and people can walk very safely on low traction floors. For example, for those of you that are from parts of the country where you have ice all winter and snow, most people can navigate ice and snow safely. Those are low traction floors. The difference is they know that they're walking on ice and so they adjust their gait. It's when you don't really know what you're doing meaning what type of hazard is on the floor is when, is when those, those injuries happen. So uh, statistically, based on all the body of research, uh, you can prevent 
up to 90% of claims by keeping your floors in the high traction range. Now these are not floors you have at home. These are floors you have in the workplace. Normally the floors you would have in your, in your home are moderate traction. They're fine, keep them dry. But when you're talking about a workplace, it's a different scenario. Here's the uh, track scan too. This you're gonna see tonight and Pat fell in love with this at the symposium. Uh, you push a button, it's actually taking samples of the floor, it's kind of, as you can see, it's doing everything on its own, so you don't really have any uh, interference, you're not controlling anything, and this is taking static coefficient of friction readings. And when it's all done, it's got a color display, and it basically says, I trust you. That's it. You just monitor. It'll print the results out, you can download the results on a uh, computer, you can plug in your, a cable that goes to your computer and save all the data, so you really have a history and it measures that's dynamic friction and as you see the static friction was higher than the dynamic that's typical and there's your little printout so there you go step one measure your floor slip resistance monitor what's going on that's your first and most important thing you could do because that's the leading cause that's the number one cause of slips and falls are your floors number one number two is shoes you're here to talk about shoes we will talk about shoes but watch your floors. Keep an eye on it. Uh, we, we also address exterior surfaces. Um, a lot of litigation takes place for people falling on stairs. And I don't mean President Biden. But a lot of people fall on stairs, oftentimes going down, because they don't see where the edge of the step is. So as you see here, this is a stairway that was painted yellow. There's a change in elevation between the upper sidewalk and the lower sidewalk. And as you can see, it was painted yellow. A very simple fix. I mean, just identify those again because the elderly have a hard time seeing that especially at night if you don't have proper lighting and so you know a simple thing like that can go a long way and this is, again is making your walkways safer um, paint a lot of people like to paint curbs and ramps and and that's fine just make sure you when you're painting any surface outside of your building that you have the right uh, aggregate sand all right, they, they make different products. Don't just paint the surface with paint because bad things happen like this. There's a lady coming out, going down the handicap ramp, and she lands right on her hip. And that's a disabled person ramp, so the standards for, for ramps are higher than regular walkways. Um, I mean, this was taken in Florida. It rains a lot in Florida, and the ramp was wet. And you shouldn't have people slipping and falling on ramps when they're wet. Um, all the videos I'm going to show you were involved in litigation. We literally have a, uh, hundreds of videos. We have a YouTube channel called Safety News, and there's a program on there called Falls Aren't Funny, and once a week we post a video like that, and we have enough videos, Pat, for two years. You're just going to see hundreds of videos of real people really falling. Second thing you need to do now that you fixed your floor and you're monitoring your floors, safety, is use the right cleaning product. Um, floor cleaning is, well, it's a dirty job. Nobody likes to do it, right? It's messy. And cleaning floors using the right cleaning products are oftentimes something that safety and risk managers know nothing about. The people that are maintaining your floors, you don't even know who they are, right? I mean, do you know what they're doing? Do you know how they do it? You really don't because the janitorial part of your company is very, they're not even in the same building. But they play a big role. So you, you need to participate a little bit more aggressively in uh, floor maintenance. The term is polymerization. There's a typical fast food restaurant, right? The floors are always polymerized. It's a combination of grease, oil, soap film, mineral deposits. It just builds up over time, soap films, because of improper maintenance. Uh, that's a quarry tile floor, the red tile brand new, right out of the box. That's a scanning electron microscope. And as you see, it's like a mountain range. Right out of the box, it's rough and it's dull. It's a dull color. But after six months of improper maintenance and just wear and tear, look what happens to your floor. Six months. That's a polymerized film. All that mountain range got filled up with oil, soap film, whatever that white stuff is in the front. But that floor looks good. To the naked eye, it's a very attractive floor because it's shiny. You just coated it. You, you kind of waxed it, in a sense. But that's what's going on when you're not maintaining floors. Here's a good example of that. Lady coming up to uh, place an order, and she shatters her kneecap. 
older woman. Uh, she was simply looking at the menu board. You see there was a wet floor sign there, but the floor actually wasn't wet. What happened is they spilled some food and the grease and oil from the food. And that's seven figures easily. If she dies, it's even more than that. That happens all the time. It's just so common. But that's a floor maintenance issue. Uh, earlier this year, NFSI did a study, it's our second study, on the effects of household floor cleaners uh, and what, what, what effect they have on slip resistance. In other words, when you mop your floor with Spick and Span, Mr. Clean, Swiffer, in your home, what happens, and this is a difficult graph to read, but the thing that's the biggest takeaway is out of the top 17 most common household floor cleaners, stuff you use every day, 12 of them make your floors more slippery. The more you mop your floor, the more slippery it gets. And the reason's simple. If I was to ask you, and I am gonna ask you, what are the two things, if, when you come home and you know the floor was mopped, what are the two ways you know the floor was mopped? Tell me. Number one, shiny. And number two, smells. Think about it. How do you make a floor shiny and give off a fragrance? Well, you're leaving something behind, right? You're, you're leaving perfume on your floor. And the manufacturers understand it, because we've all been marketed for decades that shiny means clean, right? Shiny is clean, and if the floor smells clean, it must be clean. Well, what they're doing is you're just putting oil <laughs> over and over and over on your floor. You're oiling up your floor. And over time, that oil builds up and you get a slippery floor condition. But it's counterintuitive. You're thinking to mop, mop the floor more frequently to make it safer, and you're actually doing the opposite. This happens in the retail areas as well, or commercial floor cleaners do the same thing they leave films, and those films lead to more claims. Now, you don't know this because, as I said, the people who maintain your floors, you don't even know who they are. You don't know about the products. You don't know how often they do it. Do they dump the mop bucket? They're supposed to, but do they? And it's a hard thing to manage. But understand, what you're using to clean your floors, and I don't care who you are, it's probably having a, a negative effect on your slip resistance. It's part of your problem. Okay, I know this because I developed floor safety treatments in the early 1990s that today have become very popular. A lot of companies have that technology, but they don't all use it. You'll see this NFSI certified high traction logo on lots of products, about a thousand. This is where manufacturers will voluntarily submit their products to us for testing, and if they pass, they get to put that logo on their product. You'll see it on floor cleaners, floors, floor mats, auto scrubbers, and this is your way of knowing that the cleaning products that you're buying and using are not leaving a slippery film on your floor. So we don't tell you what product to buy. We're not saying use, you know, Johnson Wax. What we're saying to you is simply set a standard for your company, because today you don't have one, I'm just guessing, that says, look, you know, we're going to buy floor cleaners uh, and, and cleaning products that are NFSI certified because we know that that will not impact, negatively impact our slip and fall problem. It's simple, it's free, and it's easy. And if you have suppliers that don't have this, one, they may be part of your problem, all right? Uh, or two, they've already submitted it to us and they failed, and they simply don't want you to know that their products failed. Um, simple, easy, do it, make it part of your corporate policies, this is it. And those suppliers, and you're gonna have an endless, the bigger you are, the more power you have. And you just dictate to your uh, suppliers, this is our expectation. See, they can't be part of your problem. You can't allow that. You can't let the, hey, the, you know, we're me too last 10%. You know, that's what you always have. Me too, you know, hey, I can sell you that and I'll save you some money. But you're paying for it somewhere else. You're paying for it in claims. Floor matting. Oh my God, who was I talking to? I was talking to you about floor matting. Floor matting, what a headache, especially for retailers. Um, Make sure when you're selecting and using floor mats that you consciously understand that floor mats present um, a massive major trip hazard. As you're trying to prevent slips and falls with entranceway floor mats, you're bringing on an elevated risk of a trip and fall. Um, especially in retail where people are pushing shopping carts, right? Push a shopping cart that's heavily, you know, loaded with water over a floor mat, what happens to the floor mat? It gets a big wave in it, right? It moves, it buckles. Um, but, you know, floor mats play an important role. Here's an example of a restaurant. It's raining out. No floor mat at the front, so you come into the door and there's a puddle. 
okay, we need to do something about that. I mean, some form of matting containment is really, really important. So they do play a role. Um, however, you have trips and falls, and I can assure you we have lots and lots of video to prove it. How often do you see this? Buckled floor mat. It's got a curl in it. How often? Be honest. You see it all the time. You see it every day, right? Every time you look at a floor mat, it's got some buckle or curl. All right, well, that presents a potential trip hazard, again, to the older person who tends to shuffle their feet. So you're in a retail environment, you're in a food environment, whatever environment it is, it doesn't really matter. Somebody that just catches their toe in that is going to fall forwards, right, and generally get hurt. Injury on the way. And here's an example. Lady coming into a bank lobby with her son. She trips on the floor mat, and she hits her head on the ground. We stopped the video because she died. This lady died. She struck her head and had a brain bleed, and it killed her. And you look at the mat, you see it's buckled and curled. I mean, it's a bank lobby. Let me ask you, who, what demographic goes into banks? Older women, right? I mean, we all do electronic banking, drive through Who goes into banks? Well, older women. It's more of a social event. So you know that your demographic is an older woman. You have to protect those people from the known risks associated with trips on floor mats. So um, meant to do the right thing, but the floor mat had moved. It was over the threshold. It was elevated. And she caught her foot, and down she went. Sally, that happens a lot. Here's actually the US Postal Service. You saw those edge ripples? That's normal. They just, yeah, what's the problem? What causes that? You've seen that where the whole edge is rippled? It's called baconing. What do you think causes that? But those mats were just laid. They just got put down by the supplier. Come on, talk to me, people. There you go. There's some experience. Correct. You're right. When the, when the supplier, the rental mat company, delivered the mats, they rolled them up, and they're supposed to transport them on their edge. They lay them down, and then they stack all these mats on top of them, so instead of being circular, the cross-section, they're oval. So that when you unroll the mat, you get that. And that is a hazard. Now, here's the bad news. If the rental mat company delivers those and you accept them, they are your problem. They're yours. You can't say, well, sue the rental mat company. No, you accepted it. And therein lies a big part of entranceway floor mats for both retail, grocery, hospital, just going down the list, hospitality. Another bad idea, do not put floor mats on changes in elevation, trying to mask, you know, mask it or camouflage it. You see there's a tile at the top that's higher than the floor below, so let's put a mat over it. Well, the change in elevation is still there, you're just harder to see. And that's a trip and fall, ready to happen. How often do you see this? Everything I'm telling you, you see all the time. I'm not bringing anything new to you. I'm just identifying what is so common, and this all presents trip hazards. Anybody know why that happens? How do you get that one? It's usually one, one at corner. How do you do that? I mean, it didn't happen on its own. We're going to show you. There's a little video we made for you. I made for you guys, just for you. So you have, uh, you know, these curled edges. It's this one rippled edge. It's, I mean, on and I mean, we're, we're going to show you example after example after example, right? That one edge is curled up. And look at that one. It's like a flying carpet on the edge. I mean, and these are all trip hazards. Well, here's what's going on. You see these, these mats get stuck in the door. And the door is going to close and open. It's just going to bang on that edge over and over and over. And it creates a curl. And then your folks say, well, OK, that's kind of their normal. They don't know what to do. So they just rotate the mat. And then somebody's going to fall. And you all see it, right? Let's be honest. You see it all the time. And you say, well, all right, if, if you're not able to police your mats, because they take a lot of work. I mean, here's another example. The mat's buckled, it's curled, it's stuck in the door. You can just go on and on and on. But if you're not really able to police your mats to maintain them, don't use them. They're going to cause you more headaches than, than you realize. Uh, here's mats laid on top of mats next to the mat. Hey, if one's good, let's make it three and just whatever, hopscotch. Um, and here's kind of an example of that. You have a mat next to a mat, lady leaving a convenience store, and down she went right through the door. Notice the back of the mat is wet. Another problem. Floor gets mopped. 
They put the mat right down on top of the wet floor. The whole floor dries except for underneath the mat and that becomes a bit of a surfboard. So you say, well, what's going on here? You know, why are people falling on these mats and how is it that they're not able to safeguard mats? Here's another example. It's kind of a tough photograph to see, but mats in a restaurant. See them all? Like hopscotch. Go from mat, you know, the mats are like islands of safety. Well, they're telling you we have a slippery floor condition, right? That's what that says. You know what that says to someone that wants to commit fraud? Do it here. Because they're telling you, yeah, we got a slippery floor problem. Oh, well, I'm just going to stage my accident here. So you have all these mats. The mats are telling you you have a, bat, you have a floor that, that, that has a low COF, right? They know that. They know their floor is slippery. So the, their solution was mats. The answer is solve the problem with the floor. Clean the floor. Safety treat the floor. Address the problem at the floor. Another bad idea. Drainage mats. That's a drainage mat. See all the holes in it? So let's put a drainage mat in front of a soft drink dispenser. Well, it's not like a good idea. So when the ice cubes come bouncing out of the soft drink dispenser, they'll land in the, the holes of the mat. It's kind of like being at the carnival, the ring toss. Hey, all the, all the ice fell in the holes. But what happens to ice? It melts. And what happens when water gets beneath the mat? It's a surfboard. You didn't really solve anything. You just transferred risk from one type to another. Uh, floor mats in front of drink dispensers are a good idea, but not that type of mat. That's a drainage mat, or some of you may use them and call them anti-fatigue mats. The other problem with that mat is there's no beveled edge. It's a half inch thick mat. That in and of itself is a problem. So they're trying to do the right thing, but it doesn't always come out in the end. So another problem is using the wrong length of entranceway floor matting. Here's an example of a massive lawsuit took place here in Dallas. A lady was coming into a big box retailer. She stepped on the mat. She only had one footstep, one contact point on that mat. And what had happened is she stepped off of the mat and she stood on the floor and the floor's slip resistance was very low. Um, the people in the front entrance thought somebody shot a gun because she landed on her knee. She had an artificial knee. And she had the, um, you know, the rod and the femur, split her femur up to her pelvis. She lost, I mean, it was a bad injury. Multi, multi, multi million dollar jury verdict. And uh, if you notice, there's a wet floor sign there. I'll show you a video in a little bit about how that sign wound up there. But this is a 40 something year old woman, slipped and fell, shattered her knee. Come to find out the retailer, um, there was some rain earlier in the day and the front of the mat got saturated, the, the part by the door. And so as the day went on, the mat got wetter and wetter. So the, they figured out, well, just rotate the mat. The wet part is now, you know, here. Well, guess what? She stepped on the wet part and like an ink stamper, took the moisture on her shoe onto the floor and destroyed her leg. Um, big problem, big lawsuit, didn't have to happen. Another example of a fast food chain, another example from a lawsuit where floor mats were installed on the floor after it was mopped. Um, hey, we got our expert coming out. He's flying in. He's going to look at the condition. I mean, you know, you know I'm coming. And what happened? There, just walk in and it's the same thing. <laughs> it's like you stop mopping the floor and putting water, or I'm sorry, putting the mat on top of the wet, the wet floor because the mat is going to become very, very slippery beneath. And this was a case where an elderly lady fell and got severely injured, a lot, of, a lot of fatalities, a lot of deaths. I talked about hazard warnings. All of you are using some form of a hazard warning sign. I invented one that you probably all use. Um, the one that pops open like a tent, did you ever see those? Folds up. I developed that in the 1990s. Um, now everybody's got that technology. My doggone patent wore off their patent. Uh, but we gotta talk about wet floor signs. Now, look. I, this is, not, this is not how you use a wet floor sign, right? You don't, I mean, the yellow one broke, so they stuck it over an orange traffic cone. I, I, okay, but that's, th these are pretty inexpensive, right? These are like 12 bucks, 15 bucks. How about that one under the uh, Dunkin' Donuts door? Is that how you use a wet floor sign? Well, I mean, they needed something to pry the door open with. Uh, here's an example of an airport where they stored the sign on a column in the main walkway. So you ask, is, is that a posted warning or is that just where you store the sign, so it's a bit confusing. Uh, here's a, there's the, that's the sign I developed, not that one, that one's actually made by Rubbermaid. 
Um, but you know, you can use them to barricade areas. If you don't want someone to go through an area, that's a good idea. You just barricade that area off. So if somebody wants to walk through those signs, they do so at their own risk. But you barricade until you can remove the hazard. Just don't leave the signs up all day. Barricade it, dry the floor, remove the signs. That's kind of the goal here. All right, so here's your uh, five steps as far as warning signs. Post them in advance of any wet, wet floor or any type of hazard uh, as to provide pedest pedestrians the ability to avoid the hazard. If you put the wet floor sign where the wet floor is, by the time people see it, they're gonna step in it. So you wanna let them know ahead of time, wet floor. And, and don't be afraid to use a, a lot of signs. There's no harm in that as, as long as you're using them correctly. Uh, place signs before mopping and promptly remove them when the floor is dry. Don't leave them out. I'm gonna show you a video in a minute about that. Signs should be at least 28 inches high and visible from 360 degrees. That's the insurance industry recommendation, 28 inches high. You wanna be able to see the sign no matter what you're doing. If you're pushing a shopping cart at a grocery store, you might not see what's coming in front of you if your cart's loaded. So a, a taller sign will catch your attention and you see it as you get closer, meaning the further away from the sign, it's still visible. Uh, barricade areas where pedestrian traffic would require them to enter a hazard, like a single entranceway room or a restroom. When you're maintaining a restroom or a break room, one door in, one door out, shut the room, barricade it. Don't let them in. I mean, restrooms close until we're done cleaning. And when you clean the floor, you don't open it up until it's dry, period. Just don't do it. Because if there's only one way in and one way out, by the time they open the door, and they step on the floor, it's too late because they're not expecting it. And of course, store signs where you need them by in exterior entranceways or just other high risk areas. But be, be aware that signs are not really a, in and of themselves a, a, a way to prevent most slips and falls. It's the last line of defense really. It's just kind of the minimal, minimal, minimal. And because they're so widely misused, um, people ignore them. I mean, let's be honest, raise your hand. How many times do you see wet floor signs? You just ignore it, right? You, it doesn't matter. And here, remember that wet, remember the, there she is laying on the ground. Look at this, look at the wet floor sign. Watch, the greeter's like, hey, what's going on? The sign is getting blown around from the doors opening and closing. You put the sign where it needed to be, but the wind was blowing it around. Now it's ironic because they're literally the paramedics, the EMTs, are responding to this woman who just slipped and fell, in a part because the signs didn't work. Um, kind of odd to catch that on video, don't you admit? <laughs> That's an unusual video. Um, wet floor signs and mopping. It always amazes me, during the day you'll see a lot of food, fast food restaurants mopping the floor in the middle of the day, usually at the entranceway. It's like, what are you mopping? There's no spill, the floors are maybe getting soil, but that's the end of the night you do the big, the big heavy mopping. Um, but nonetheless, that creates risk. You mop a floor when you have customers in your lobby, you are elevating the risk. It's, you just raise the risk, so minimize risk. Uh, putting wet floor signs out during the mopping process, obviously that's important. Uh, you wanna identify potential hazards. Um, but you know you don't want to be mopping the floor during the course of the day, like this video. It's a sunny day, he's got the wet floor sent out, he's mopping, mopping, mopping. Right behind him is a vestibule, that's how you get into the restaurant. And he's mopping the floor right between the vestibule area and the dining room of the restaurant. And here comes the first customer, and by the time he sees the sign, it's too late. That happens all the time. Well, don't mop during that cycle. I mean, unless there's like a spill, and then if say you have a spill, somebody spills a Coke or something, just get out there with the paper towels and kind of contain it. You don't need mops and buckets. So that's a bad policy. That's a policy that needs to be revised because that's a policy that says um, we're, gonna, we're gonna accept additional risk of a slip and fall during business hours, and you don't really want, you don't really want that. And again, this is customer oriented. This is not, um, behind the house. You know I was gonna get to it, Pat. We're gonna talk about shoes a little bit. That's okay with you. Uh, wearing the right shoes. Slip resistant shoes can uh, reduce slips and falls by half. There's a lot of published research. This came from Liberty Mutual. 
There's a lot of published research that says getting your people in the right shoes will pay big, big, big dividends. You already know that. And um, there are shoes that have exceptionally high uh, benefits, like SR Max, and there are some that don't. Um, but you don't really know because a lot of what goes into slip resistant footwear is a bit of an unknown. Now, all of you, would, would it be fair to say most of you, if not all of you, are safety experts, risk managers, people who are involved in this profession. You hold yourselves out as professionals. So I get to be the lawyer. And I'll say, well, you have shoes. Do you require slip resistant shoes, sir? Okay, so you do use them. Gotcha, and you require employees to buy them or you provide them. And so on the bottom of the shoe, does it say slip resistant? Does it actually say that? I mean, if I'm looking at the shoes, how do I know? The reason I'm asking is, if the shoe doesn't say it's slip resistant, maybe it isn't. But if it says it is, then the next logical question is, and it's the tough question, is what does that mean? Can you tell me what the word slip resistant means? Sir, tell the jury. You don't know. You know why? Because the term's never been defined by any industry. Footwear, floors, floor cares. I've testified in front of the building code three times. The building code, ADA, National Fire Protection Association, every government standard requires that walkways and the means of egress, where disabled people have access, shall be slip resistant. If you, all know, you all know that, right? The federal law mandates slip resistant floors. And you say, well, what does that mean? How do I know? How do I measure? How do I know? And the answer is you don't know because the term's never been defined. So what you're doing is what everybody does, okay? But we're gonna fix that. We've already fixed that. We're gonna make it a little bit easier. Um, more research that talks about slip resistant soles. This is the gentleman, Kurt Beshoner, who um, the speaker yesterday, Jeffrey referenced as the leading expert. He's the gentleman that authored our standard. He was the, the genesis between the NFSI B101.7 standard for measuring slip resistance of shoes. And you'll see the very, very, very first testing device that he, in essence, engineered. So shoes go a long way, they work. And there's some components that are just generic. And again, this was a review from yesterday. Large flat soles, you wanna have a sole that does provide a lot of surface area so you distribute force uh, evenly. Um, remember when you were asked yesterday about are harder shoes soles better than softer shoes? Well, lower shore hardness actually goes a long way in developing slip resistant soles for interior uh, applications, not necessarily outside, like construction sites. Um, and so having soles that have a little bit more flex will actually conform to the texture of the, sh of the floor. So if you have that little mountain range, remember I showed you the photograph of the mountain range of the floor? A softer sole will bite into those little, what's called disparities. But outside, it's a different story. So we do have to kind of set a, um, a limit here. And of course, a beveled heel. The beveled heel. Is that the, is that the magic bullet now? I think that's, I take it as a yes. Uh, not a lot of people do it, but it's important. Here's a good example. Here's SR Max. You have these channels. And again, this is a redo from Jeffrey yesterday. You have channels where these fluids, if you're on a liquid, can go somewhere. Um, this is kind of the technology that we developed with the Tread Safe line many, many years ago, is you have this channel flat pattern that allows this movement. It, and it doesn't just work for liquids. It also works for thicker, more viscous products like oil. They will move. And we've got a video that shows this movement under the sole. So you, you develop a pattern like SR Max that has a, a superior but yet simple design. It's a simple design, but it works really, really well. And you're, you all know this because your, your people are wearing these. The key is to reduce that hydro planning. Um, when, you, when you don't have full contact between the sole and the floor, uh, you, you have a, a lower level of traction and it becomes problematic. And so you wanna reduce that hydroplaning effect. Uh, the downside of this, which Jeff talked about yesterday, which is a problem, everyone knows it, is keeping it clean. You step on french fries and they get packed into that pattern. That was the problem we had when I developed the line of footwear as well, is how do you clean these shoes? The, the beveled edge, this is an example, right from, this, right from the research, that shows that 17 degree bevel, meaning the heel has a bevel. 
And so the testing method that you're gonna see at our offices tonight sets that bevel at 17 degrees. We come down, the shoe contacts the floor at a 17 degree angle. Why? Because that's the average angle uh, that a person will take as they're walking. If you actually measure the stride angle as you're walking, it's about 17 to 20 degrees. And as we age, that number kind of shrinks and people tend to shuffle more. So if you build the shoe with that bevel on the heel, you immediately get better performance in term of, terms of slip resistance um, on the heel. Now, Jeff talked about the battery. You put the battery, okay? Another way, and this is from the research, is they do, I don't know if you see this or not. It's like a USB. See that, the USB little stick? That's just another gauge that you can use to see if there's enough wear pattern on the sole. That's what wears first, is the heel, right? The, the heel wears the most, and depending what aspect or part of the heel. Um, what we do, the national standard for shoes, all shoes, not just work shoes, but every shoe, uh, calls for a heel angle to be set at 17 degrees. Uh, one of the things we do is we test on three different surfaces, VCT, quarry tile, and whatever else. A lot of clients will say, you know, we want to test uh, a particular shoe on our floor. So if you have, a, you have pieces of tile that you use in your restaurant or wherever, and you say, we want to test a particular shoe on our floor, that can be done. And then, of course, we add a lubricant, water, but the most common is canola oil. That's the standard. I just gave you kind of a basic footprint of the testing method. And that's how shoes are tested. Uh, here's kind of a photograph of the device which you'll again see tonight. You see that 17 degree angle, and this is testing on quarry tile. We test wet, dry, or with canola oil, or canola oil and water. Uh, but it's extremely, extremely precise. Very, very accurate. When Jeff came to our offices this morning on the way to the airport, he's like, this is it, I'm buying this one. So it's really a great tool, but it comes down to just mitigating risk. You make floors safer. This is the traction scale. This is what you are going to see very, very soon on all shoes, all floors, and all floor cleaners. Why? Because the, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, the federal government, is reviewing our petition calling for this to be mandated by law. Manufacturers have got to do a better job of communicating the traction benefits or risks of their products. You need to know that the floors you're buying meet one of three traction ranges, that the cleaning products you're, make, you're buying are either making your floor slippery or they're not, and that the shoes that you're wearing, and I mean all shoes, not just work shoes, that they have an inherent traction ability that you, the consumer, have a right to decide what risk you want to take. I mean, we don't care. We're not mandating a coefficient of friction value, but if you're gonna make a floor and it's low traction, but you don't want to tell your customers that because, well, that's bad for business. All you've done is you've set your customer up for what? Claims, people are gonna get hurt. You have a responsibility as a manufacturer to do this. And um, as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about this. We have a lot of, a lot of supporters. I, we're pretty confident this will pass, probably unanimously. Why? Because the problem is so massive. And we have guys like, you know, groups like Ralph Nader and a lot of all the safety organizations are supportive of this, and I would assume you would, right? When you're selecting shoes or you're selecting floors or cleaning products, don't you want a uniform label? Does this make it easier for you to do it? I mean, honestly, I'm seriously, raise your hand. Is this a good idea? Or do you like it like it is now where you don't know anything about anything and then you're paying claims? I'm not picking on you, Mary, I'm just saying. So that's it, that's the, that's the standard, that's the NFSI B101.5 product labeling standard, and if everything falls into place, no pun intended, this will be federal law, and so everybody that's selling you shoes will have to do this, they have to tell you. They have to test, and they have to label. Now the standards are published, the labeling standard is published, it's all here, it's been around for years. Yes, sir? But they'll still be able to say they're not slip, as long as they're saying. Ah, very good question. You use another magic word, non-slip. What's the difference between non-slip, slip resistant, non-skid, skid resistant, skid retardant? We can keep going. Yeah. 
They're all, they're all adjectives that describe some inherent benefit without being defined. So people use it, right? So to answer your question, the term slip resistant for shoes will be high traction when wet or oily or dry, meaning you can walk on a dry surface or a contaminated surface, and if it's ranked as high traction, that shoe is for you. But you say you're just buying a pair of you know, street shoes, just want to walk around town. We well, don't need high traction, that's, that's a higher threshold. Moderate traction shoes are good for you. But if you're wearing shoes that are really, really slippery, they have a very slippery sole. What's a good example, Pat? PVC? Compounds that are... Crocs. Okay, Crocs. Those are low traction, right? But you don't know, what's, what's the most dangerous shoe in the world? I wrote a book about this. That's amazing. Did you guys all read the book? Yeah, flip-flops. Flip-flops. It's amazing how many retailers get sued and there's a litigation and they show the surveillance video. Mrs. Jones was coming into our store and it was raining out and look, look, she was wearing flip-flops. There she is. And you'd agree, Mr. Kins, your flip-flops are dangerous. In fact, you wrote a book about that. And I'm like, yeah, they are. They're very dangerous and you sold them to her. Are you saying you sell dangerous shoes? I mean, she slipped wearing your shoes in your store. I mean, somehow that's her fault? Why didn't you put a warning tag? Well, instead of a warning tag, you just put this on the flip-flops. You, you follow me? Low traction. It's kind of like when you buy a package of cigarettes. For those of you who smoke, it says, caution, this may lead to increased risk of cancer, right? Now, people still smoke. I mean, it's still America. Go smoke. Buy whatever you want. Buy whatever you want. But there needs to be some responsibility because you'd be amazed how many people do not connect dots. The mentality is as long as it was sold at a, at a retail store, it's got to be safe. Well, not necessarily. They don't even define the term slip resistant or non-skid or pick a term. So you're going to see a lot of this. The last couple of slides really deal with an issue, and I heard some conversation about this this morning, and that's safety culture, employee attitudes towards safety. Uh, interesting statistic, uh, National Safety Council, which I'm on their board of delegates, did a perception survey, really clever. And they revealed that 73% of workers, your workers, they do believe that the company does prioritize safety. They get it. 72% uh, said that management showed they care about employee safety. So they're, they're hearing the message, but catch the next line. One third of workers said they're afraid to report safety issues because they also know that the company promotes efficiency. And that's the confusion. They don't know how to weigh the difference. They don't feel confident, they don't feel comfortable in speaking about issues that they find to be problematic. A good friend of mine, T. Scott Gross, wrote a book about millennials. I uh, wish he'd write one about Gen Zs. But uh, millennials are a whole different crowd. I mean, you, you train them differently, they learn differently. I'm a baby boomer. I learned by sitting me down with a manual and, you know, a Coke at the, my first job was at a fast food chain. And that's how we learn. We learn from written documents. That's why you guys publish catalogs, right? It's for us old guys. Old guys want to read it, right? Younger people don't. And so what he revealed in his book is that, you know, young people, they just see the world differently, Gen Zs and millennials. And they're, they're kind of instantaneous. I want it, I want it now. I guess Amazon made that a, an issue. Uh, they're also really into technology. They, they, not that they know a lot about technology, they just use it. I mean, how often do your workers, millennials and Gen Z, you can't get them off their phone, right? I mean, they're on the phone. I don't mean on the phone. Do you see the study that they did where they, like most Gen Zs don't know what this means? I mean, that's a phone. They think this is, I'm on the phone. Um, but they take technology for granted. They, they care a lot about this subject. But there's a lot of disconnects, okay? They have a very high uh, social consciousness. They want to do the right thing. But here's the biggest problem you have. I mean, it's just the biggest problem. It's how you train them. They're not going to sit behind a desk and they're not going to read a manual. They're not going to watch your CD or video that you're going to show them. They learn from that smartphone. That smartphone is tethered to them. That's the direct link. So you have to train them that way. And we work with a lot of companies we, uh, on, the, on the safety news uh, pot, uh, website and, and YouTube channel. We actually have these short videos. We teach in one minute clips. Every one of your employees has access to YouTube. They're on it all the time. 
all the time. Direct them to training, whether it's yours or ours or somebody else, that gives them those short little snippets that they remember. I was talking to Ashley about another thing. We brought on a, a gentleman who's gonna be doing rap music. He's a very famous rap star. And, and what he educated us to is a lot of young people learn from rap music. They get the rhythm of the beat and just give them a message. Just the same message over and over and over. They get it, they remember it. So you have to adjust your, your technique, how you, how you go to business. Um, scan that, because you're not getting my card today. Hopefully that works, because sometimes if you don't have Wi-Fi, it won't work. Everything you ever want to know about me, Pat, well, you already know everything you need to know about me, is from that QR code. Uh, you have a book, that's my gift to you. And the advantage of having the book is it lists all the standards, you know exactly what you need to, to do in order to be compliant. No secret, okay, no, uh, no mystery. And um, in, enjoy that. And frame your policies around those standards. That way you can be assured that you're in compliance. Otherwise you find out the hard way, right? You find out when, when the lawsuit comes. And, and lawyers are not your friend. Even your lawyers are not your friend. Let me assure you that. You know, one of the biggest headaches I have, and I lecture a lot of companies, I'm like, your problem is you have too many lawyers. Because lawyers are always whispering in the CEO's ear, don't do that, don't do that, it's all this risk. Don't test your floors, that's discoverable. Yeah, it's discoverable. Wouldn't you want it to be discovered? Yeah, we test our floors and we find problems and we fix it. You say, don't test your floors. The first question that comes up from the jury is, well, why not? This is your single biggest problem, don't you care? So all those millennials that are on your jury are gonna say, you don't care. 